questions would be that allowed you to do this without risk to your career. How many of you would like to do this research by raising your hand? Almost everybody. I mean, so there. So I, I present the, the issue back to them, saying, well, why am I different? The only thing that makes me different from you is that I was willing to take a risk because I'm interested just like you are, except that you know, I'm, I'm willing to say, well, it seems more interesting to me than things like having a very secure career because ultimately our lives last that long and you know, do something interesting. That's my philosophy. So that, that's part of the way that I, uh, I see what is happening in terms of this taboo which has persisted and needs to break. Now, there's, there's something that people always want to know, uh, ask us, and they say, um, so I'm going to ask you. Um, they say, okay, all this quantum stuff is nice, but what's the payoff? What does it mean in my life? What does it mean for me personally? What does it mean for humanity? What does it mean to society? How does any of this stuff happening with little subatomic quarks, what is that, what's the payoff? Why should I, why should I care about any of this? Well, my father studied philosophy for many years and I never got it. I never understood why would anybody care about things like basic assumptions about the world. And now I understand it a lot better, partly because I'm older and able to reflect back on, on my life and history. But the reason that, that philosophy is important is because it, its purpose is to look at assumptions, to look at assumptions about who and what we think we are, about the way the world works, and so on. So from a, a science point of view, the, the philosophy focuses then now on two different kinds of worldviews a worldview of the classical type and of the quantum type. I fully expect later there will be something that is beyond the quantum, but just in, right now we can compare these two. From the classical side, we are mechanistic things. We are like little robots. And robots, we can build them, we can throw them away, it doesn't matter. In addition, robots don't have any conscious experience. It's like asking whether your computer has a conscious life. Most people think that's probably not the case. So you can throw it away, turn it off, it doesn't matter. Well, what if that was, what if the assumption was false? What if that is actually not true, that there's some other way of thinking about the way the world is? Up until 100 years ago, we didn't have any reason to imagine that there would be another way. But because of the advent of quantum mechanics, which was largely driven by mysteries about the nature of light, that after following that track for many years, Many of the, of the physicists who developed quantum mechanics and think about it have been forced to become philosophers because they're forced to look very carefully at the assumptions that we make about the kind of world that we live in. And what's really interesting is that the physicist philosophers have moved in the direction of holism because that's what the physics says. Living in a holistic environment is very, very different than living in a robot world. And the consequences of that are still not fully worked out, but it will have a very strong impact in the next couple of decades in terms of how we think about ourselves. So when we think about holism, sometimes we say, well, it's like ecology. You know, 30 years ago, ecology wasn't even a word. And it means that there is an, an interdependence within the world. But we're talking about something which goes way beyond ecology. It's not simply interdependence but an interpenetration, a coexistence of things at a very deep scale, not just among living things, but everything. Just as ecology has changed our way about how we think about the world, like the idea of sustainability in the world, that's new. What will the world be like when we have a notion of sustainability of thought and sustainability of ourselves and in the future and in the past? We don't know yet what that's going to be like, but it'll be very interesting to see it develop. Now, what are the, when you say there it seems to be a correlation, I mean, statistically, what are the, what's the deviation from randomness that someone focusing on having more ones would happen? Is it like two to one randomness or is it a 10 billion to one or? Well, the, the last analysis that I did, which looked at all of these experiments, the, the, the final analysis is 50,000 to one. The odds against chance are 50,000 to one 
that the behavior of the random number generators would go in the direction that they did, that were consistent with what intention was wishing them to do. Now, what about the people who you know, they criticize? They say, well, you know, that's just statistics. That doesn't really prove anything about the mind-matter interaction. How would you respond to that? All of science now, all of empirical science, is based on statistical analyses because nothing ever works the same way twice. And this is especially true when it comes to human behavior. I mean, so an example is, why are people interested in sports just obsessed with statistics? Because human behavior is variable. So when we look at a good baseball player and they have a, say, a 400 hitting average, that's incredible. But all it means is 40% of the time they'll, they'll get a base hit. So why do we say, well, so what? You know, they're not getting 100% of the time. We understand that some forms of human behavior are simply difficult to repeat, even among world-class athletes. Here, we're dealing with something that's much more subtle. We're dealing with a direct mind-matter interaction. And so you're not going to see it 100% of the time. And as soon as that's the case, you have to deal with statistics. Statistical arguments are used everywhere in science. And I understand that if, if you're, you're not a fan of mathematics and you don't trust statistics, maybe think about baseball and think about why statistics are so important in sports. And it's purely because of the uncertainty in sports. Excellent. Um, so do you have any theories on the mechanism that makes when someone sitting there with their intention going, I want more ones than zeros? Do you have any, because, you know, What's, is it just magic? Is it, is it just spookiness? Or do you have some sort of theory as to why someone's intention, which seems to be an internal intangible thing, can affect a, a random event? The, the way I think about what's happening with, in the random number generators, or in intention in general, why does intention leak out and get out outside my head somehow? I think about it as the, the relationship between mind and matter. What is that relationship? Well, one way of thinking of it is we, we take a ribbon, and on the outside of the ribbon we write the word mind, and the inside of the ribbon we write, write the word matter. So they're tightly correlated. And in fact, we know that. If you look at an EEG or you look at a functional MRI picture of the brain, what's going on inside the head is tightly coupled to what our subjective experience is like. So it's like this ribbon. If you shake the ribbon, the mind and matter will kind of shake together. So they're related in some strong way. But since they're two sides of the ribbon, one part, it's not the same thing. They're two sides, and they can't interpenetrate somehow. So they're, you know, where does the mind and matter connect? So I would say all that you need to do is imagine that the ribbon that we've been looking at was slightly misconceived. It actually is not a ribbon. It's a ribbon where somebody put a half twist in it.